The number one killer in the United States is heart disease. And for people with heart illness, that means major surgery, a lifetime on expensive drugs, or even worse, death. But there is a natural way to prevent and even cure heart disease. And that's the focus of our next story. Maybe help them with, the, with themselves and their families to learn about eating much more healthfully. Too. Most people only start to think about health care and medicine when they get sick. Of course, a better strategy is to always think about your health and avoid getting sick in the first place. Two of the most important aspects of staying healthy and avoiding illness are lifestyle and diet. Nutritionists say a good diet will help you stay healthy, while a bad diet is a formula for disaster, and most of us are eating a bad diet. We're in a crisis when it comes to health, and part of that is because we're eating the wrong types of foods. Normal food is fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans, the foods that we're designed to eat. We're actually, most people eat abnormally. And that's the reason that about 70% of the people that we have in our hospital today, like here at Castle Medical Center, are there because of their diet and their lifestyle. Heart disease is the number one killer. Then comes uh, cancer. And a lot of that has to do with the foods that people are eating. The good news is that a healthy diet a very healthy diet can reverse the illness caused by bad diet. The leading proponent for reversing heart disease through good diet is Dr. Dean Ornish. Well, for the last 25 years, we've conducted a series of studies demonstrating for the first time that even severe heart disease can actually often begin to reverse when people make bigger changes in diet and lifestyle than had been previously recommended. And the premise is that your body has a remarkable capacity to begin healing itself and much more quickly than we had once thought could be done if you change the underlying causes of the problem rather than just literally or figuratively bypassing them. While many traditional medical interventions seek to address only the symptoms of heart disease, good diet can actually cure the disease in a measurable way. One of the nice things about heart disease is that the technology for measuring it is so advanced you can actually measure the blockages or the plaques in the arteries. You can measure blood flow to the heart. You can measure how well the heart is pumping. And we found that within a few weeks, most patients became essentially pain-free, even those who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting severe chest pain. We were essentially pain-free within just a month or so. But they not only felt better, in most cases, they actually were better in ways we could measure. Dr. Ornish has worked with thousands of heart patients, and many of them have become living testimonials for the Ornish diet. One day I was at the theater and I ran across the street to get a snack and an elephant sat on my chest. Uh, I just got this enormous pain. I went to the doctor and he gave me uh, the various tests, a treadmill, and uh, wound up with an angiogram which showed that I had 100% blockage in my right main artery and 90 and 85% in my uh, left main arteries. And I was told by four cardiologists that if I didn't have a bypass operation immediately, I wouldn't live out the month. Surgery seems like a quick fix, while diet and lifestyle change seems like a slow process. But Neil saw results almost immediately. Uh, when I started it, I had a cholesterol of 372. It's 113 now which is, I, I lost 40 pounds, uh, uh, seven inches off my waistline, felt good. Uh, seven months after I started it, I, middle, I finished in the middle of the pack of the Great Aloha Run, an 8.2 8 mile run, and I knew I was in good shape. Neil is rather proud of the fact that his approach to treating heart disease proved to be more successful than the bypass surgeries done on many of his friends. Well, I know that of the people who are my contemporaries who had bypass surgery and had bypass surgery again since then and have had angioplasties and are still not feeling well and and uh, you know I've not I've not lived four of the uh, three of the four cardiologists who are younger than me who told me that the program wouldn't work. Well Neil Pinckney's recovery seems astonishing Dr. Orner says his experience was not atypical. No, it's not. In fact, part of why I'm so passionate about doing this work is over the last 25 years, I hear story after story like that, 
that people who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting severe chest pain within a month are essentially pain free. We found overall a 91% reduction in the frequency of angina or chest pain in all the patients and most of them became pain free within just a month. Within a year you know, one man, for example, was climbing 130 floors a day on a Stairmaster who couldn't walk across the street without getting severe pain. One of the first patients to try the Ornish diet for reversing heart disease was Don Vopel, a psychologist at the University of California in San Francisco. I had a massive heart attack at work at 11.05 in the morning uh, and was taken to UCSF and they told me I had about three months to live and to go home and get my affairs in order. Don went on the Ornish program and saw positive results in just three months. My angina, and I had severe angina, went away within 90 days. And uh, my overall health, I would say at the end of nine months when I realized I'd lost over 100 pounds and I just had all of this energy and a new zest for living. I realized that this is something I could do. It was, it was not hard to do at all. Don not only felt better, tests showed he was better. Through the course of the study, we had angiograms continuously. I've had about 14 of those. Uh, I just came back from my yearly physical in San Francisco, and I reversed heart disease approximately 88%. For most patients with heart disease, the options usually given are surgery or medication. But Dr. Ornish says not enough doctors tell their patients about the other options. If I have a patient who has heart disease, I say, okay, you've got a variety of choices. We could arrange for you to have bypass surgery or an angioplasty. We could put you on medications and or you could change your diet and lifestyle. And then we go the benefits and risks of all those different approaches. Now, if you take an evidence-based approach and you say, are there any studies proving that angioplasty, for example, prolongs life or prevents heart attacks? The answer is no. Those have never been shown, even though we spend billions of dollars on those operations. And if you say, what are the evidence looking at randomized controlled trials of bypass surgery, only a relatively small percentage of people has it been proven does it prolong life or prevent heart attacks, maybe three or four percent. Now, most people don't know that. They're told, okay, you've got heart disease, we can operate or you can die. That's the choice, as, as some of the patients in our studies were told. And yet, for most people, that's not really true. Deciding against surgery not only avoids the possible complications of surgical procedures, but in fact, it increases the odds of survival. We know, for example, that up to half of the bypass grafts have reoccluded or clogged up again within just five years and a third to or more of angioplasty arteries have restenosed or clogged up again within just a few months. Whereas if you can change the underlying causes of the problem, which are really what we eat, how we respond to stress, whether or not we exercise, whether or not we smoke, and the quality of our relationships, that we can measure, ironically, using these very high-tech, state-of-the-art technologies, how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can often be. There's a certain inertia that keeps people eating what they've always eaten, whether it's good for them or not. And sometimes it takes a health crisis to change a bad habit. I'm so glad you're all here. For Rebecca Woodland Hawley, it took about with cancer to convince her to change her diet. Seven years ago, I had cancer and I wasn't healing very well and I had a really bad experience and I never wanted to repeat that experience and so in the process of trying to recover I got some good advice along the way and did some research and found a naturopathic physician who recommended that I go vegetarian um, but really it's more of a whole foods diet not just cutting out flesh foods but eating more plants um, beans, whole grains, legumes, things like that. Rebecca now teaches classes on vegetarian cooking here at the Castle Medical Center in Hawaii. She says you shouldn't think of being a vegetarian as sacrificing the foods and tastes you love. The one thing I learned is um, the concept of sacrifice. We often think, especially when we're making a change in our diet, or, or we think we're giving up something that we enjoy. And we think that, oh, this is going to be a sacrifice, it's going to be really hard. But the dictionary definition of sacrifice is giving up something of value for something of a higher value. 
And in this case, that was my health. Because without my health, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a life. One of the problems with the typical vegetarian diet is that while it may eliminate meat, it usually still includes dairy products like cheese and milk. Think of how many animals drink the milk of another species. I can't think of any except humans. Think of an animal that drinks dairy as an adult. I still can't think of any except for humans. So in nature, you already have some clues that tell you that that's not meant for at least daily consumption. And uh, if you look at the science behind it, dairy products are high in fat, high in cholesterol, high in saturated fat, very much like liquid meat. And if milk from cows is an unnatural food for adult humans, so are the eggs of chickens. I think eggs became very popular maybe in the 50s because there was a nutrition theory that uh, people had, uh, who had poor health uh, were protein deficient in some way, which we now know is not true. But eggs became popular because they're relatively inexpensive. You can have chickens that churn out these eggs. And I think with all good intention, they were trying to solve the problem of, of protein because the egg whites, of course, are uh, almost pure protein. Uh, the problem again with eggs, though, is the yolk is 215 milligrams of cholesterol. That's like an eight ounce steak. Many people, particularly women, think dairy products are important in the diet for calcium and the prevention of osteoporosis. But Dr. Shintani says that is not the case. If you look at osteoporosis rates, which is the main reason why they tell you to take dairy to prevent osteoporosis, uh, there's there's practically no evidence that dairy prevents osteoporosis and lots of evidence that, in, that suggests that uh, it may be related to osteoporosis in some way. For example, the countries that consume the most dairy have the most osteoporosis. In fact, some research shows that dairy intake has nothing to do with having healthy bones. The main point about the calcium issue is bone strength. And all you have to look, do is look at the native Hawaiians. Some of them grew to near seven feet tall. The amount of dairy consumed, the answer is zero. So how essential is dairy to bone health if a whole population can have strong bones without any dairy? So should you become a vegetarian? It's not an easy choice because there could be risks. One of the most common criticisms of a vegetarian diet is lack of protein. What often happens in terms of the so-called pitfalls of vegetarianism is a lot of times, in my experience, uh, protein is a deficient element. I think that there's a misunderstanding in the idea that certain foods are protein adequate when in fact they may not be. It's almost impossible to develop a protein deficient diet if you're eating enough calories to maintain your weight. Now, I have to qualify that. Now, I'm talking about if you eat a well-balanced vegetarian diet, you're going to get all the protein as long as you maintain your idea. Now, if you're eating a vegetarian diet that's just Coke and potato chips, then you definitely will have a protein deficiency. At the Castle Medical Center, a Seventh-day Adventist hospital, they believe so strongly in the vegetarian diet that they have eliminated all meat products from the hospital cafeteria. In fact, they recommend nothing short of a pure vegan diet. Pure vegetarian, or what we call the vegan vegetarian, which I believe is really the optimal way to go, is that it's totally plant foods. There's no animal products in it at all. It's all fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes. There's no dairy products, no eggs, no meat products. The advantage there, of course, is that it's completely devoid of cholesterol, uh, very, very little saturated fat, unless you eat a lot of coconuts. Um, and uh, this probably is the more optimal way to go.